Okay, great. Um, I am going to kick off. Um, it's so great to see so many people signing up for this session. I'm hoping that you'll you'll find it useful. So this is uh, the second session um, in today's event around working in the think tank sector. Um, one of the key aims of think tanks is to try and influence policy adopted by government. Essentially, we make recommendations and we want the government to adopt them. Uh, my name is Maddie Timon-Jack. I'm an associate director at the Institute for Government. We are a think tank that focuses particularly on trying to improve how government works. Um, so that's the sort of focus of what we do. Um, but I will be chairing the discussion today. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by colleagues from three different organizations, although so far I think we've only got two of them on the call. Um, but, but so far I have with me uh, Dan Tomlinson, Senior Economist at the Resolution Foundation, Rachel Hutchings, researcher at the Nuffield Trust, and we hope we will be joined shortly by Asa Rahman, Policy Officer at the Trade Union Congress. Oh, he's here. Yes, I can just see you, Asa. Great, you're with us. Um, so Asa's here too. Um, the way that we're going to run this session is each of them are going to speak for a few minutes about what their organisations do um, and how they approach influencing policy in their work. Then I will open up for audience, audience questions. Um, it's worth saying that please do feel free to type in your questions in the chat as we get going so that I can start seeing what people want to, to ask. Um, and then, but you can also have put your hand up using the hands up function um, during the discussion um, and we can come to you um, once we've once we sort of concluded the opening remarks and, and you can be unmuted to ask your, your question in person. But as I say, do feel free to chuck things in the chat as we go um, so that I'm aware of it. Um, I think just to say the recording of this discussion will be available at the end, as I think has already been um, suggested. But um, without further ado, I will hand straight over to Dan to kick us off. Thank you. Um, and uh, thanks to all of you for attending uh, this session. I hope it will be helpful and informative. Um, so my name is Dan Tomlinson. I am a senior economist at the Resolution Foundation. And we are a think tank uh, that focuses on uh, the incomes and the living standards of families in the UK on low to middle incomes, which means that we do a lot of research looking at uh, things such as employment, pay, housing costs and benefits, the things that make up uh, the incomes of uh, families on low to middle incomes in the UK. We are a quantitative think tank, so we, we primarily uh, do our research with numbers. So some think tanks will uh, do reports um, that are much more focused on writing and argument and um, explaining what's going on through words and description. Um, others will focus on um, talking to people and doing qualitative research and telling the stories of uh, individuals and their experiences. Uh, and we do do a bit of those other two things, but primarily we focus on um, producing rigorous and clear economic analysis using analysis of big government provided data sets such as the labour force survey um, or the living costs and food survey these uh, surveys that are representative of the population as a whole and we spend a lot of time crunching numbers and spreadsheets um, and we try and influence the public debate and change policy via um, publishing research that is clear and trusted and impartial uh, and that journalists will pick up and write about um, in national newspapers so that we can shape the public debate in ways uh, that um, are helpful in explaining um, to policymakers the impacts of their decisions, particularly on families in the UK on low to middle incomes. I'm just going to give you one example um, uh, of, of how we've done that in practice, um, and I'd be happy to talk about others such as the work we did on the uh, furlough scheme during the pandemic when we get to the question and answer. So um, if I take you back to 2015, which is a while ago now, but I think this is the uh, most crisp and clear example that I can give you. Uh, the government announced that it was gonna make very significant cuts to tax credits, which are the benefits that um, millions of families in the UK on low to middle incomes receive. Um, and we knew that this wouldn't be good for the um, families in the UK on low to middle incomes who were receiving tax credits. And we knew that it was important that the public debate was informed and shaped by an accurate understanding of how, of how families would be affected by this policy change, this big cut to tax credits. So we got to work 
we uh, wanted to firstly um, explain how much money uh, would be taken away from families um, who received tax credits and, our, and on average it was £1,300. We wanted to uh, show how many families would be affected and we crunched the numbers and we estimated it would be around 3.3 million families, which is a really big share of uh, the overall number of families in the country. And we wanted policymakers and decision makers um, to understand um, which groups would be more affected than others. So our analysis showed that families who had children would face a bigger cut in their income. So a, a couple family both working with two children would have lost over £2,000 a year, which is a really significant share of income for say a family on 15 or 20 thousand pounds a year 2000 is a big cut um, so we published a number of reports and blogs and uh, uh times them uh, with um, some significant political events such as the conservative party conference in order to influence the public debate um, and to shape what journalists were, were writing about and what politicians were talking about um, so that it focused on this issue of cuts to tax credits and um, how of how families were going to be affected and how many were. Um, it's worth talking about the things that we didn't do briefly. So we didn't start a hashtag, for example, um, and uh, try and get the issue trending on Twitter. But there will be other very good and respected think tanks and campaigning organisations that would have, I'm sure, I can't quite remember what the hashtag was back then, but would have been doing that sort of thing. Uh, we didn't, and we don't as a think tank, do that much lobbying of government ministers in person. So there are some research organisations that try and influence policy um, by a big chunk of their research team building really good uh, relationships that they try and maintain over a long period of time with a whole range of ministers, special advisors, senior civil servants. And yes, we do maintain those relationships, but that wasn't the primary way by which we sought to change policy by lobbying ministers in person in meetings. Um, and nor did we tell the story of individuals themselves. Um, we, uh, we focused on the numbers and there are other groups, say for example, the Child Poverty Action Group that would have put out stories of the individuals who were affected by this change. Um, so we wanted to produce good research that was trusted um, as as impartial and as accurate by both journalists and, and decision makers. And we think we did a good job of putting that information out there and helping shape the public debate, because in the end, the Chancellor did perform a U-turn at the time, uh, George Osborne, and the uh, cuts to tax credits that were planned didn't go ahead, which would have uh, been, which was very good news for the living standards of the, of the, of the families up and down the country on low to middle incomes. So that's a quick uh, example and an um, introduction to the work of the Resolution Foundation. Thanks very much, Dan. That was that was really, really useful. I, I think your example was very helpful as well. I've noticed a couple of questions have come in the chat and I'd suggest maybe for the sake of time, if you're happy to reply to the ones that um, uh, sort of directed at you, Dan, and, and I can come back on the IFG's um, internship scheme as well, just so that we can carry on sort of moving the conversation on. Um, next, um, to sort of hear sort of from a different perspective, um, we have Afsal. So I will pass over to Afsal and he can talk about the Trade Union Congress and the work that they do. Great, thank you. Um, can you hear me, by the way? Yes, great. Um, thank you and th thanks, thanks to thanks to Maddie and thanks to Dan. Um, for those uh, contributions so far. And thanks to everybody for coming along as well. It's really exciting to have everybody here. Um, I am a policy officer at the TUC, the, which stands for the Trades Union Congress. Um, we are a membership body for trade, for trade unions in the UK and trade unions represent um, workers uh, uh, who like organized workers in in workplaces up and down the country um, to help them campaign for better employment rights, safer workplaces, better pay, better terms and conditions. Uh, the TUC brings together 48 trade unions. So we don't directly have uh, workers and members of the public signed up as members of the TUC. Uh, workers sign up to trade unions, usually that are uh, relevant to the industry that they work in and then those trade unions are a member of the TUC so through that mechanism we bring together over um, five and a half million workers so how does that fit into the sort of trade uh, into the think tank policy um, world 
which is probably the next question that's worth answering. Uh, we at the TUC have uh, a, a, a rel in my team has a relatively big cohort of policy policy officers, policy workers, policy people, campaigns people, um, and we engage uh, similarly to other think tanks in the um, in the sort of po politics and policy space. So some of the some of the stuff that we do that's quite similar to lots of other people is we will conduct research, try and present it clearly, accessibly, communicate it in a way that puts across uh, the issues facing workers. Um, and we use that research to argue uh, for better jobs, more equality, um, and an economy that uh, favors work workers. Um, and um, and we, you know, we argue for safer workplaces and things like that, which has been really important during COVID. Um, so, so that's one route. We publish our research, we get it into the press, we hope it gets the attention of policymakers. Um, we put our views directly to politicians, so to to be have relationships um, within the trade union movement, particularly with um, with opposition MPs. Um, at, at the moment, but we also have, uh, min you know, the, the business minister will attend, um, will attend some of our meetings, and we have uh, relationships when needed um, with the government as well. So Dan mentioned the furlough scheme. Um, our, my boss will have been in some of the meetings with the, with the chancellor as well uh, to represent some of some of the workers' concerns around that, um, and. Yeah, so so we do so we we have direct contact with politicians and policymakers, and we and we do our research. We also engage um, with with businesses. Businesses are often and and industries industries and business often have um, sort of employer bodies that represent their policy interests. Um, we will engage with those in various sectors because. We, we we sort of represent the worker side they'll often represent the employer side um and sometimes we will um you know we will government will engage both of us and we will have a sort of uh there's a discussion and a conversation and a negotiation often that happens in those sorts of spaces and i can and i'll give an example of that because i think that's probably the space where we do something a bit different to other think tanks um so uh, um, the best example of uh, a policy making process that involves us as the representative of workers and trade unions and uh, and employer bodies is probably the low pay commission, which is part of the which is um, independent of the government, but it's given its remit and its funding by the government and the low pay commission looks at it's an independent body which looks at economic evidence um, every year and recommends what the minimum wage will be the following year. And the government has has always accepted that recommendation, although it has the power not to. Uh, that's an example. The body is a real example of partnership working. Um, so it, there are the, the secretariat who administer it all, our civil service, our, you know, neutral. They're not civil servants. They they work for the low pay commission. They're independent. They um, and on the commission sit academics who are uh, experts in wage setting, economics, business, uh, and relevant 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 things. Uh, the there are experts from business, so economists usually from places like the confederate uh, from, from the confederation of business and industry the cbi um, and then there are people from the trade union side so people from the tuc um, and often people from some of the large trade unions and what we do is my work um, involves pulling together lots and lots of evidence about the experiences of people of workers on low pay um how they're how they're experiencing uh the cost of living, their what their how far their pay is going, what their workplaces and the industries that they work in, how how they're getting on, whether they're doing well, whether they have more money to pay their workers a little bit more, 
uh, and we pulled together a load of evidence on that. So something that I I I do every year is um, point out the level of level of profit, the level of dividends coming out of industries that employ low paid workers and 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 say, you know, there's a little bit more slack here to give people a bigger pay rise. Um, what the business side will do is, you know, point to point to the reasons that some businesses are struggling and 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 we will have a negotiation and then the the secretariat and the policy side of it and the government side of it will take those take those views on board. The academics will come down on a side as well and they tend to be you know more changeable about what they do um but the really important thing about it is that we all come to a decision together and we put that recommendation to government we negotiate we put forward our economic evidence whoever's economic evidence is stronger um is able to pull the negotiation further in their own direction uh, it's really important that we produce uh, research that is credible that not only influences the people in the room, but influences the wider conversation because that has an impact on some of those negotiations. Um, yeah, I won't go on further about it, but that is an example of um, what we call social partnership working, where workers, employers, organisations sit in the policy policy space and um, work directly with policymakers to establish some government policy. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Afsan. It was in interesting to sort of reflect on where you and Dan sort of share some approaches in terms of producing reports, but also where the TUC differs and how it tries to influence government, particularly, I think, reflecting the nature of the organisation. Um, so I know there are a couple of questions coming in the chat about the sorts of skills and expertise that might be relevant to think tank work, which we will get into in a moment. But I will very sort of last, but very much not least, I will pass over to Rachel from the Nuffield, um, who can talk a bit about her organisation and the experience there. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much, Maddie. And um, yeah, thank you, everybody, for coming along today. Um, I am a researcher at the Nuffield Trust. Um, so we are a think tank that works on healthcare. And in terms of what influencing policy means to us, well, our aim is to use evidence to improve the quality of healthcare for people within the UK. Um, we're an independent organisation as well, and we aim to provide um, kind of independent commentary and evidence on a wide variety of topics. Um, so we covered um, social care, prison health, um, the use of technology in the NHS, and we've done a lot of work during the pandemic on the impact um, of the pandemic on things like routine healthcare services. So in terms of how we go about it, I think a lot of the things that have been mentioned um, already are things that we do as well. So they're common across um, think tanks. Um, and I think that what it shows is actually that there's a huge range of different things that all contribute to influencing policy um, and kind of making effective change. So I'm conscious of time and kind of getting to questions. So I'll just try and whiz through a few recent um, topics um, that give some examples. So we also produce um, evidence and we conduct a lot of research. Um, I'm personally mainly a qualitative researcher. So I do a lot of work on things like literature and evidence reviews or conducting interviews, for example, with NHS staff on different topics. But we also work a lot with big data sets, big um, healthcare data sets as well. Um, to sort of see um, what's going on. Um, we do a lot of work um, within that actually looking internationally. So that's something that's um, I think um, an area that we find really interesting is taking some of these big healthcare challenges um, and looking at how other countries have addressed them and identifying lessons for the NHS um, from there. Um, we do a lot of kind of sense checking or providing information type work. So providing um, information for different audiences um, like journalists. So um, we produce something which explains why winter is a difficult time for the NHS and the sort of pressures that it faces. Um, and we also do a lot of work with a wide range of stakeholders as well. Sometimes that's through particular projects, um, but we also do a lot of work kind of um, in an ongoing way to sort of develop those relationships and understand the kind of context. So we've talked a bit about government, but we work a lot with the NHS as well um, and people across lots of different settings to make sure that we're kind of producing things that really will resonate and be kind of practical as well. Um, and we also do a lot of parliamentary work, as has been mentioned. Um, I think also it's worth mentioning we are one of 
a number of think tanks that work on healthcare. So you might have heard of Health Foundation and the King's Fund as well. Um, but there are obviously others whose work touches on healthcare. And sometimes if it's a really important issue, we also work, um, kind of come together to um, produce information or produce evidence for different audiences um, where it's valuable. So social care is an area that is really um, high priority at the moment, really important issue. And it's an example where actually coming together with other organizations can really help kind of reinforce some of those messages. So I'm conscious that was a very quick whiz through, um, but I'm really keen to kind of get to questions. So um, yeah, happy to answer anything. Thanks, Rachel. That was that was very concise. Um, I, I think just to say very briefly to everyone who's watching, I know there are a couple of questions that are specifically about what qualifications we might look for in a candidate. It's worth saying that none of us are recruiters ourselves, um, so we can share our own reflections from um, being in the organisations, but I don't want to sort of be held to that. Um, so a couple of sort of general questions I might sort of bunch together and then get each of you to reflect on. I noticed there was a sort of earlier on question about um, sort of what how relevant sort of international experience might be whether that's something that um we might value in think tank sort of sector in the in the uk and there's also i know a very specific question on having specific software experience which i think dan given your sort of quantitative um focus you might be able to reflect on whether resolution sort of looks for sort of ex pre-existing skills or whether it's something that might be trained up and that might again reflect on the different levels um, and then finally there's a question as well rachel that might be relevant for you around given you're just talking about the qualitative work that you're doing around sort of whether you ever get into ethnography and whether sort of anthropology degrees might be useful um i just would quickly say i did see someone asking whether sort of whether they're just submitting a piece of research that might be similar to a think tank might be a way to sort of try and approach someone it might be a way to start a conversation but i think for probably most think tanks will have a sort of set recruitment process that you would need to go through so that's worth checking but if you want to have a conversation with someone at the think tank to talk about that that's not a bad way in I would say um so maybe Dan if I can come to you uh first on specifically on the sort of software question but also any reflections on the sort of international experience side of things as well uh from the resolution foundation's perspective at least um it's good if, um people have experience of any software package that's used to analyze micro data. We use data, as I said in the chat, um, but if someone knows how to use another package like SPSS or R, those skills are quite transferable and um, you should definitely not feel put off from applying if you don't use the same statistical software that we do. I um, joined the Resolution Foundation having never used any form of um, software package like that. Um, uh, so it isn't it isn't even an essential skill to be here, um, uh, but definitely having a good understanding of numbers and maths and how you might go about doing quantitative analysis will be important if you want to work at the Resolution Foundation. Great, Rachel, can I come to you next on the sort of ethnography question? And then I've got quite an interesting challenge from uh, someone who works in the civil service at the moment about um, policy-based evidence rather than the very answer we might, might come to that in a moment but yeah Rachel can I come to you next yeah absolutely um really good question I think what's important to em emphasize is that um we have a really like diverse range of different skills and backgrounds that people um work with us that have um we um kind of really try and look at you know the, as has been mentioned those transferable skills rather than just the kind of particular background um so I think taking that approach is really valuable. And I've got a colleague who, for example, is doing, um, she's doing a PhD alongside working with us, which is in looking at ethnography. And um, so we do a lot of, um, uh, we do a lot of different types of research and having a, a kind of anthropo anthropological background can definitely be really valuable. Um, but it kind of depends on the particular project that we're working on, the sort of different approach that we use. So we have a wide variety of different things um, we do and it's sort of relevant to the, the particular question um I think also just I saw something in the chat about um you know working on alongside clinical careers and just to say we do have people who do that as well so we've got a number of colleagues who work at the Nuffield Trust um some days a week doing research other days a week they're working as a GP another is working as a acute consultant um acute medicine consultant as well so I think it's really help it's really important to emphasize that there's a huge variety of backgrounds in terms of research experience. I personally um, 
did a law degree, so I didn't really come from a kind of research background. Um, but I think it's all about those kind of skills and the different perspectives that people bring, which is really valuable for the work um, that we do. Yeah, definitely. And I think just sort of I, I can jump in on the international experience perspective. I mean, at the IFG, we do look at international other countries and how they work as sort of lessons that the UK can draw on. So I think actually people with international experience can be really useful. And we had a, an intern who did work in the Australian government for a while. And she's actually now gone back to Australia, but it was really useful for us to, to be able to draw on her expertise on that. Um, as well, one of, the, as well, one of the questions I want to come to you on, I think I'm going to end on the challenge from the civil service, um, is Sam has asked, do you feel that like you have much impact? And if not, do you, how do you deal with the frustration that comes with that? Which I think is a really interesting and important question for us to reflect on. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think um, I'm going to wrap it in a little bit with those, some of those comments um, about uh, policy based evidence, um, which is when, which is, which I think means when, 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 when people come up with a policy, and this is from somebody who's in the civil service, when people come up with a policy and then say, can you find me the evidence for it? And then we're going to do it. Um, uh, and, and research is done in that, in that way. Um, I would, I, um, I think it's, I think for, for, for the TUC where I, where I work, um, a stents so think tanks, think tanks all, have varying degrees of political position uh, and that you know some are explicit about that and some are uh, some are some are some are more neutral neutral think tanks as well um and where the places that i've worked it has been hard actually over the past uh decade or so um to to influence the government um but as a as a government um, enacts more and more policy, um, where it is selective about the evidence it uses to put in that policy, where it's more ideological about the reasons that it's putting in that policy, um, the further actually the justification, the, the more selective they are about the evidence they use to justify that stuff. And it's our responsibility in the think tank world to point to evidence that um shows the full picture even if the government would not you know for political purposes uh it's diff it's difficult for them to see the full picture and when we do that and when that gets a lot of coverage and when that gets a lot of attention we are up ultimately influential um but i would say that there are peri there are periods when different uh think tanks are in favor and when different think tanks are out of favor and it de and it depends on what the issue uh, is that the think tank works on? So, if you have a if you have a crisis in an area of policy, and if there's a think tank that works in that area of policy, you will be influential during that period. If you have a think tank that's particularly close to uh, the agenda of a government minister, that think tank will become influential during that period. So, just yeah, that's 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 what I would say. That's, that's that. helpful. As and I'm I'm gonna we know we've only got one minute, but I'm keen to get down to Rachel's reflections on sort of similar sort of question. Because um, it was asked again. So, Rachel, can I come to you next for any reflections on the frustrations of not having impact, but also the role of think tanks, I guess, in trying to, to encourage <laughs> evidence based policy? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. And it's something that I think everyone is frustrated in when it, it's the policy driving the evidence. I mean, part of the reason I wanted to work somewhere like Nuffield is I had previously worked in healthcare charities that focused on particular. Um, patient groups, for example, and advocating on behalf of them. And I, I loved that work. I really did. Um, and I felt like it was really meaningful and I really enjoyed it. But I also always felt I was never quite getting the full picture. So I really wanted to work for a think tank that was independent and actually wasn't necessarily influenced by some of those campaigning um, sides as well. And as um, it's just been mentioned, the kind of extent to which think tanks might be political is really varied, but we um, we're really it's really important for us to be independent and I think in terms of how we contribute to that debate obviously the kind of research and evidence that we do is really important but I think one of our really key roles is acting as that bridge between the kind of public um, public and also kind of what can seem quite abstract research so actually providing that role to communicate really clearly just what's happening and that kind of sense checking role um, and I think that that's been quite important we've seen throughout the COVID pandemic, for example, when there's been so much 
so much reported so much data it's quite difficult to necessarily kind of work out what's right and wrong but we've been you know trying to really focus on providing independent information about what's happened happening to the NHS how is it comparing with previous years and that sort of thing so part of the reason I really enjoy working for a think tank is is that you can have that kind of occupy that middle ground I guess um, and provide that sort of independent um, insight um, so yeah I hope that kind of helps to answer the question <laughs> no I, th I think that's true and I mean the other thing I'd say is longevity of reports the recent um, government white paper on leveling up re referred to a report that was published by the IFG I think in 2011 so sometimes things that you might have written quite a long time ago might come back around again and that I think speaks to some of the frustrations around impact Dan do you have a final I'll give you the floor for the final sort of very much minute because I am running over I promised I wouldn't so <laughs> very briefly if you have anything to add um I I think that in the think tank sector, sometimes it's difficult to see what your impact is because um, you don't have a really direct line from the work that you do to policy change that happens. Um, but there's definitely still um, examples. I mentioned universal credit. We can also see that on tax credits and the furlough scheme from the Resolution Foundation's perspective, where the work you have done has, has contributed to the policies that governments implement. And there's also a lot of value in helping explain, particularly through the media, but helping explain to civil servants, policymakers, decision makers and the public what's happening in the country. And that is important in and of itself. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, Dan. I think it's a great point to end on. Um, thanks, everyone, for tuning into this session. Do rush off to the next one. Um, there's one starting in three minutes. Um, one is on policy work and opportunities outside of London. Um, and another is a day in the life of a researcher. Um, but do also feel free to get in touch with any of us if you do have any follow up questions. Um, I do appreciate it's a difficult sector to get into. Um, and so I think I can say I'm going to say for all of us that we're always happy to, to have a conversation and, and sort of answer any further questions. Um, so yeah, do enjoy your next session. I'm sorry for running over. <laughs>